Okay, let's get into some key terminology. And what I want to do is keep it down to sort of a minimum to get you started. Once you're working with it, as you move further, uh, the terminology will start to you know, explode. But let's uh, talk about the regions and availability zones. These come up a lot, and they're pretty intuitive. The regions are what you think. There are regions throughout the world. We'll show some of these when we're doing the demo. And typically, you want to uh, confine your, uh, your uh, applications to a region, because within the region, you have low latency, dedicated networks. The availability zones are within a region. Not every region, but most of the big regions, the ones that we're going to be dealing with, uh, what we call recommended regions, have at least three availability zones. This is how you get your redundancy. Uh, you, the availability zones are collections of data centers that have their own independent power cooling and networking. And so what you might do is have your resources be redundant across availability zones within a region. Now, I also mentioned on this slide something that's not really belongs on this slide called availability sets. But I mentioned it because you run into that term and you might get a little bit confused. Availability sets are user-defined sets where you would spread over at least hosts, hopefully racks, within a data center. So you get some redundancy, but not the sort of redundancy you would get by spreading between availability zones. There are a couple of terms that come up here that you should be aware of. Uh, zonal services are services that you put into a zone. For example, if you have a virtual machine, it's got some disks, of IP address, objects, and so forth, there's no sense having them in different zones because that would actually reduce the mean time to failure. Because if any zone had a problem, you would have a problem using that virtual machine because its disk was over in that zone. Uh, so that, that's called zonal. The zone redundant is what gives you the increased time to failure or the resilience. And uh, that's uh, often done by Azure automatically and if it's a so-called zone redundant service. Now, uh, you can have neither when you create a resource, which means sort of, I don't care. Put this resource wherever uh, is you know appropriate, leave that up to Azure. Recommended regions are always those that have availability zones. There are some other regions that don't, uh, but those typically are not uh, used. So let's talk about resources. I, I've already used the term, and it's exactly what you probably have deduced it is. A resource is basically an atomic entity within Azure. It is a subnet, an IP uh, address, a VM, uh, a disk that's used in a VM, a network interface, a uh, network uh, security group, so forth. Pretty much everything is a resource in Azure. And resources are combined into logical collections that are called resource groups. These don't have much meaning in terms of, say, region. A resource group is really an administrative collection for administrative uh, efficiency. And uh, you can also budget or monitor resource groups, as the name suggests. But one of the great things about resource groups is for testing. So you set up a resource group. If you put all of your resources in that group, and once you're done with your test, you can blow away the resource group with a single step. And it will remove all the resources and then remove the resource group. So it's really an administrative efficacy that is, uh, comes into play. Here's an example. We're using the uh, Azure CLI to create a resource group. Uh, we're going to give it a location. And that's not, now it sounds like I contradict myself. I said you could have resources from different locations, different regions. Yes, but there's a default location. And that's for convenience. Also, you have to put the metadata for the resource group somewhere. 
and that's actually where the metadata would be stored. So here uh, we're setting up something for a customer. We can monitor that customer's use of resources. We can remove that customer very easily if everything associated with that customer is in a single resource group. Now our virtual networks are basically our namespaces for our IP addresses, private IP addresses. And they are confined to a region, and they're basically defined by a collection of sitters. Uh, that if you, you don't have to, it'll be given this by default. Uh, it's important that the IP addresses be uh, uh, unique within the VNet, but your various VNets can have overlapping uh, IP addresses. If you're familiar with AWS, your VNets are very similar, very uh, similar uh, uh, to the uh, DP. Uh, uh, C, so virtual uh, private clouds. Uh, they uh, are private addresses, but RFC 1918 is not enforced. So if you could put your sort of favorite uh, technically rootable IP addresses in there along with your, uh, with your uh, sitters. So here we're creating a, a VNet with the Azure CLI. Now, uh, within the uh, within these uh, uh, VNets, you will have multiple, well, zero or more subnets. They are typically defined by a single sitter. You, you can go beyond that, but typically that's not what you want to do. You typically have a simple single sitter that is a subset of IP addresses, private IP addresses from your VNet. And the nice thing is, within a VNet, the routing between your subnets is, by default, implicit. So you don't even have to set up routing tables. Azure will take care of that. We'll, we'll get into a little more detailed discussion of that when we talk about routing later on. They can span multiple availability zones, uh, but not uh, regions, uh, which is exactly what VNets do. So here's an example. We assume we have a VNet. And we're going to create a subnet from a subset of addresses in that VNet. As with all resources, we have to put it into a resource group. Now, by the way, the uh, Azure CLI allows you to sort of combine things. So you could, as an example, uh, create your VNet with the previous command I showed you, but with put in options for creating subnets at the same time. I sort of prefer to keep them, these commands short. But and, and typically what will happen is it'll be the same API calls. It's just that one uh, CLI command will make multiple API calls. Network interfaces are probably what you think they are. They're associated with a subnet when you create them. They can sort of stand alone, but they're not of much use. Typically, you're going to associate them with a virtual machine. You can remove them and reassociate them and so forth. Uh, and they can only be attached to a resource in the same region. And they uh, can support accelerated networking. This is an issue, of course, with our product until the 6.7 or an 9.15 release where we're going to do accelerated networking. So you're going to see this term coming up. If you're familiar with how uh, SRIOB works, it's pretty much direct access to the NIC by the, uh, by the uh, VM in a way that you can share the NIC between VMs. Uh, also, uh, a DPDK for Linux, they've taken these and they branded them as accelerated networking. So here's an example of creating a NIC, put in a resource group, give it a name, say what VNet it's in, say what subnet it's in. We're going to give it a private address. Uh, we can give it a public address. By the way, we don't need to give it a private address. If we leave that out, it's going to choose the first available private address in that subnet. And we can turn on or uh, dot accelerated networking. Uh, we could allow or by default not allow uh, IP forwarding. Security groups are 
created by default or you can create them and modify them, they're basically apples. They uh, do what you think apples do. They support TCP, UDP, and ICMP. And they're these five uh, tuples, basically. They are stateful connection-based. Uh, so it's more like a firewall than a router, if you will. They're, they can be associated with network interfaces or with subnets. And this is what gets a little bit tricky. If your traffic's not getting through, it could be, could be because of either. So you got to think, uh, if traffic's not getting from virtual machine A to B, does the, what is the uh, NSG on the interface? What's the NSG on the subset, subnet that the interface is in? What about the subnet that it's going to? Does that have an NSG? And then what about the interface that it's going to? Does that have an NSG? So you might actually have up to four NSGs that come into play with a uh, VM to VM traffic. Now, I'll just give you a little bit of an idea of what the rules look like. They are most obviously IP addresses. We have inbound and outbound rules. There's also something called service tags. This is where we really see uh, Azure, you could say, making its move, uh, uh, Microsoft taking over the world. Uh, more and more is done in Azure with service tags. For example, in, in the demo I'm going to give, I set up a Linux box with MySQL. But Azure will say, no, don't do that. Use our MySQL. You don't have to worry about patching, security, redundancy. You don't have to worry about upgrades. We're going to run. Uh, we're going to run a SQL server, and you can use it as a service. There's also the same sort of thing applies to Active Directory. Uh, and you can just say, uh, let's see, Azure Active Directory is probably up here. You could install an, uh, a server and run Active Directory or use their Active Directory service. And there are about 60 of these right now, backup services. And, uh, and and so forth. So, in particular, you can refer to them in your apples. So you don't want to, or you do want to allow access to or from, say, a uh, the Azure AD server or the Azure SQL server. Uh, there's also something called application security groups, which is sort of a way of collecting IP addresses for convenience. And let me show you that in the next slide. Basically, it's a logical collection of network interfaces. This is essentially how you do the attribute-based security uh, groups, attribute-based access uh, rules. So for example, you can have one for your web servers. You can have uh, a different one uh, for a different web server uh, that, or a different VM that's actually maybe talking to a database server. And then you can apply your rules to the ASGs instead of worrying about applying them to the, which, whatever subnet it's on or whatever interface it is. So ultimately, this becomes rules on the network interface, but it gives you that convenience of attribute-based uh, security. Private IP addresses, I mentioned them before. I just want to mention, again, uh, that they're typically RFC 1918. There are many that are reserved, and some of them are kind of interesting. The first one in your subnet is the gateway, and that's where you uh, have the implicit routing, unless you want to set up your own routing to override that, like uh, route things to a, a firewall. <laughs> as we'll see in the next class. There are a couple that are reserved, but not in use. And there are a bunch like the DHCP server. The DNS server is kind of maybe not, would not be your, uh, your first uh, guess. I'm sorry, that should be a seven. The, uh, and we recommend, or Azure recommends DHCP by default. So in other words, you set up a Linux box or Windows box, and you give it a private IP, uh, that's going to go 
if you look at the if you look at the VM, it says the HTTP. It doesn't say that private IP. The idea is Azure knows that private IP that has been assigned to the net, and will use DHCP to deliver it to the interface on boot. The advantage of that is you get some flexibility if you move the VM around. Also, it's a, a way to break things. You could put a static IP on a VM. Everyone knows how to do that in Windows and Linux. But if you do and it doesn't match what Azure thinks the private IP is, then no traffic will pass. So stick with the HTTP unless there's a compelling reason to configure the VM differently. And as far as the public IP address, that's automatically sort of natted by uh, Azure. It allows you to have a public IP, either to manage a VM or, say, uh, to get inbound access to a web server. The, uh, there are uh, typically what we're going to see this on network interfaces, but also on a variety of what we call gateways and load balancers that we'll talk about later in the presentation. There are two different SKUs. A lot of this is historic. The basic SKU you could say is the older, the SKU, the one with less functionality. Uh, they don't support the availability zones and certain uh, things uh, like the NAT gateway, certain load balancers, and so forth. The standard SKU is the better SKU, you could say, and uh, that's uh, going to be the one that I prefer for most of the things that we're going to be doing. Now, there are virtual machines. I think we all know what they are. I will warn you, they're sometimes called NBAs. The, uh, there's a whole bunch of these guys, uh, in various instance sizes. So I'll just kind of quickly, uh, quickly show you that. Uh, we basically have series of instance sizes and, uh, for example, uh, uh, general purpose compute or memory optimized. If I look at general purpose, uh, we currently support the firewall in the uh, DB4, uh, and we don't support these really big ones. We support the smaller ones, uh, which give you, and here you can sort of see up to four CPUs, uh, uh, two NICs. Uh, four NICs, we, uh, but they actually go up to eight NICs that can give you uh, aggregated throughput of 30 gigs. So a lot of a lot of different types, and that's a, that's a bit of a pain point that we don't support all the types that our customers uh, always are asking us or frequently are asking us for. Now, if layer two is a little bit weird <laughs> in Azure. It's basically the documentation says it doesn't support layer two. And that's a good guideline. But of course, there's layer two. It's just how it's implemented is rather odd. So I just, for your, mainly for your own interest, I show this. If you look at a network interface on a VM in Azure, it has a MAC address, of course. Uh, but if you start to look at how you're talking to other VMs, you'll notice that all the MAC addresses are the same. The router and the other VMs that you're talking to. Because this is essentially a proxy by the Azure infrastructure that says, at layer two, just give me the traffic. I know what to do with it. <laughs> I know whether it goes to the router or to another VM. So that's, uh, this really does create limitations for things like HA that you can't work with layer two in the way that you are accustomed. And with that, 